Good. There you go. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the Poetry Den, where words once written on a page are not performed on stage, and solidarity extends between poets and friends. Please give yourselves a round of applause for being here tonight. <clears throat> Again, for those that are new here, my name is Pam Blair, uh, the founder and the host of the Poetry Den. Uh, we've been around for like uh, 10 years now, and in this space, I want to say six. I never can get it right because we just we're just old we're just old friends now. <laughs> um, for about six years now, um, I'm sporting the Poetry Den shirt. I think I might have some people online that might be doing that as well. Um, we have some you might see some bracelets over there that are free. You just have the portrait in on it and the Facebook um, link that's on there. So feel free to, to take one of those or that there might be some portrait in pins that you can have. Um, uh, I also have, I feel like I have t-shirts. So if anybody is interested in like purchasing a t-shirt, I might be able to prof uh, provide you with that too. I think I only have two larges here, but I, I have some at home. But anyways, um, some logistics are the bathroom is in the corner in the back. So um, if you go back there and use the fan to wash your hands, we will all know that you just finished using the restroom. So um, just a little tidbit. Also, if you're on the phone and you because you can tell there's a kind of an echo here, if you go in the uh, in the hallway and talk, we will all hear your conversation. So <laughs> it might be best to uh, maybe step out, but we asked that um, everyone could either, you know, turn, put on their um, vibrate for their phones or whatever, uh, so we can respect uh, the poets that come to share tonight. So how this kind of works is we um, we weren't here last we weren't here last um, month due to weather conditions and. Um, some other kind of hiccups, but we're back here today. We have a wonderful featured artist for you. Uh, we start with an open mic and then we end with our featured artist. So uh, I always say you sign up when you show up. And if there's anybody again in the audience that did not sign up or online, thank you for all those that are online uh, this evening. If you decide you want to read, if you're online, just let um, George know in the chat. And if you're here, you just, wave to me and say I want to read and we'll make sure that you get heard tonight and probably around the uh, seven o'clock 715 mark. Um, if we've already ran through everybody, we will probably bring our featured artists up so I encourage you not to wait. This is a welcoming place. Uh, we love our first time poets that come up and read and I really believe that um, if you have not done this before, you will be inspired to do so. Um, how many first timers here? Oh yeah, that's awesome. So what I like to do is pay respect to the place that we are allowed to do the poetry den in. Um, this is a historical landmark here in the city. And usually I ask George if he'll do like a, a, a mini speed, you know, just version of um, the space that we're in and the, the beautiful thing about the space we're in. So please give George a, a welcome as he comes to the mic. Thank you, old friend. Thank you for all the people who are here the first time. It is your first, definitely hope it's not your last. And for so many reasons, not just uh, what happens out of this space now, but that what happens out of this space now reflects, seeks to directly address seeks amends for and seeks repair for the harm that happened out of this space. Countless tens of thousands of people in this city that we now call home. You are in the former girls changing room of the Engman Public Natatorium, the city of South Bend's first indoor municipal swimming pool. And it's that word public etched into the concrete that we think of a lot. Who carved it? To whom do they apply its meaning to? And to whom should have they applied its meaning to? Because the people who ran this space, people who look like me, in spite of the fact that African-American people had been in this city since before there was a city, 
in spite of the fact that they had been coming here in growing numbers and contributing directly to the city's growth and expansion and change. In spite of the fact that all human beings deserve to be treated with that word public equally and evenly. People who ran the space denied entry to African Americans for 14 years and then segregated by day for another 14. How then could it have been called public? And what did it mean that a portion of that public denied the meaning of that word to include all people? It was an act of violence. And I'll repeat that it impacted, I don't know how many tens of thousands of people, and we are unquestionably not only living with the echoes of that injustice to this day, but new injustices every day since through today, we will continue to feel for generations to come. So what we do from this space is reclaim it. Proudly proclaim that word public to mean everyone. Breathe the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. In spite of what we're seeing now with deliberate attempts at censoring history, particularly for school children, but also others, believe and turn head first strongly that we must have the hard conversations because then and only then can we ever believe that we might make change out of the space of injustice it must also breathe joy and at least once a month <laughs> pam gives us the pleasure of allowing joy to echo through this and you're doing the exact same thing letting words letting beauty letting humanity breathe into this space so whether you're here today to enjoy, whether you're here to present, no matter where you are in that, whether you're at home online, whether you're here with us, you are here with us in spirit if you're at home online, but you're here to breathe joy. And I dearly thank you for the privilege of doing that. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, George. I pay him a lot of money to say nice things about me. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start us out. Um, I like to start us off with some poems so we get people ready. Um, those that have signed up, there's no there's no order. So I'll just call you up. And so you guys can just be ready um, when I call your name. Um, with this um, being Black History Month, um, I really hate saying that all the time because it's just it's history. I just want to say history month. <laughs> um, I'm just going to read some pieces. I was uh, asked to do some things at the library, but due to the weather, we weren't able to um, do that event. And so I, there's a couple of new pieces that I wrote, but um, I also have this one that I wrote around this time in 2022. <clears throat> it's called, Can I Read You a Poem? I want to read you a poem about flowers and summer breeze falling in love through the colors of autumn leaves. I want to recite to you the feeling of a puppy dog's cuddle, the laughter I get from a small child's giggle. I want to share with you my gift after the shatter of divorce, the birth of poetry that gave me a new voice. It would have been nice to sing you a song one where the whole world sings along. Write lyrics that place good in all the places that disclose wrong. But today's spoken word are not yesterday's recited dreams that only surface itself on the anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King. Today's word I share with you in the faces of a nation willing to seek genuine transformation from all historical dehumanization. I speak to you on the colorblind's behalf, demand a polygraph, reveal true vision through the eyes of biased opinion. Can I say the, to you that your feelings are something that you own, but respect and the same right to others is what you owe. This is not a Birmingham letter, but I too hope that the deep fog of misunderstanding be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. 
This poem for you I prepared, a commitment we all must share, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Today I urge you to see a legacy, dreams that trade supremacy for equality, desires that make the content of my character a possibility. Can I read you a poem? What's that piece? Got one or two more here. Um, this piece is called, I wrote this piece in conjunction with um, the event that I was supposed to be, do at the library was based on uh, Langston Hughes. Any, everybody, anybody heard of Langston Hughes? Kind of, sort of. My son's name is Langston. He was actually named after Langston Hughes. Um, but uh, his poem, I Too, um, and this one's called I Am the Darker Pers Persuasion. And this is a new piece. I am the darker persuasion. I have no disclaimer, except history has persuaded you to distrust my behavior. I am of the darker persuasion when my right to bear arms doesn't count when police invade the wrong house. I am of the darker persuasion in America where dreams are sold, introduced, introduced to communities deleting the neighbor and leaving me in the parameters of the hood. I am of the darker persuasion, loved as the tan Barbie doll, weaved in hair, tits, hips, and lips, sell more records than talent does. I am of the darker persuasion. We fund higher education, filling arenas and stadiums through athletic exploitation. I am of the darker persuasion, where systems are broken, hope seems free, and hatred is 400 years woven. I am the darker persuasion, but I am not your superstition. Just that piece. And this last piece I share before I bring up uh, some of our other feature or some of our other open mic guests. This is called uh, The Process, The Struggle. Um, I do a lot of, uh, I've noticed that I write a lot of justice pieces, um, and it might be due because that's really close to my heart. Um, unity among races is really close to my heart. I do some diversity um, courses, you know, throughout, like I, I partner with um, St. Mary's and now at Notre Dame. And so having conversations around dialogues about race is very close um, to my heart. So it's kind of how some of these things come about, just me processing. So the process to struggle. <clears throat> Humanity, the final frontier. And where do I fit in this vain existence in life? Torn by the decisions of man, so many experts so little still understand. Remember the days when we could plan staycations and vacations with feet planted in beach sand? College tuition says American dreams. American dreams lead to American greed. Greed forces people into homelessness, narcissists, and poverty. I gotta be in debt to be legit. More bills in my mailbox than bills that constitute my freedom to live. Minimum wage took forever to change while those stimulus checks stimulated the economy and ironically stimulated a shortage of workers globally. In all honesty, smartphones made you virtual. The pandemic made it conceptual while human connection becomes scarcely unavailable. With resistance as the new norm, vigilantes tear down our capital's doors. Social media seems to know more and more than any college course you spent time and money for. These are the voyages to a flag we sing. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. That's that piece. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm gonna ask CJ, 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 CJ. CJ's first time to report you then. Please welcome him.
Okay, this one's called Sheep. I know they don't understand me, and it hurts them to try. I don't blame them, but I hate the favorite lie. I want to tell everyone that listens that I won't leave them. If they tell me, if they tell me that I moved them, I'll listen back. If they leave, they never listened, or they couldn't. So they could never really have ever heard anything. I speak because I've listened to everything until everything repeated and drove me insane. There's no more time to listen. There's only obeying replies to the words and the lies. If I don't speak, I will be lost. I hear, or I hear to say that I've found myself. By believing, I cannot see myself, and that is why I'm here. By smiling and feeling the smile as it is and as it is forever. I've never lost it since some Someday it will leave me, but I will never know, and neither will it. I am eternal, and I always will be. This one's short. Um, a terrible smell turns my head. A terrible smell turns my head. The disgust is automatic. Sadness follows me. The senses witness death, almost there. Families are weakened and tortured. There's nothing but fear in their smiles and visitor lies and say their goodbyes. Silent cries from behind their eyes, everlasting the guys, and death is with them already. All right, give it up for CJ one more time. Also feel free if people are presenting, you can snap. If something sounds good to you. You can say, oh man, or you can say, woo child. Like whatever you feel you need to do. Um, but yeah, claps and snaps are always uh, welcome as people are presenting. Thank you again, CJ, for being with us. I hope you come back. Uh, let's see, Deb. Yeah, let's do this. Please give it up for Deb. And I just have one tonight, and I wrote this a long time ago. It was um, for context, it was um, the year of the polar vortex, and I was in a business ethics class at Bethel, and we had to address a current event that posed an ethical question from the um, perspective of like deist and theist and postmodernists. So that's what this is. I was hoping to make an impression with my presentation. I needed something to create a sensation. So please humor me as I share my limerick. Yes, I realize it's just a gimmick. During this blustery and snowy season, we've had many a day and reason to remain at home or on vacation, avoiding our schools and occupations. This could prove a challenge for Cupid and his minions. And from my worldview, I formed an opinion. While our community was under lock and key, a local business remained open, a chocolate factory. I could patronize the local chocolatier, rejecting values I hold dear, or look for solutions to this dilemma. Maybe a night at a cinema? But chocolate and confections are the standard, no exception. But if I am a theist, I will cease and desist. Safety and people are important, not equal, to the profit and production that can become our seduction. If I have a propensity for postmodernity, then truth is relevant and who's to say what's benevolent. If I agree with existentialism, I will applaud his renegade wisdom. To chart his own course and show no remorse for the risk of citation, his infatuation with round the clock efficiency, is there any leniency? For the snow and the ice and the nuts and the ridges, ruts and the ridges, driving to work leaves us in ditches. But if I was a naturalist and nature is primary, 
I would consider this winter just out of the ordinary. To satisfy Mother Nature, I would exclude God our Father, no celebrating this day of love for each other, unless we include plants, animals, with our sister and brother. For those who are deists, believe God exists, but leaves us to our own strengths and wits. This is one more example of mankind using privilege to tally the scorecard and push to the edge, the ones who are dangerously close to the fringe. And if the nihilist were to visit our town, you would recognize them by their frown. No joy and no hope, they are full of despair, for there is nothing, no nothing, worthy of care. So as I try to stay true to my position of theist, I abandon the gift, double dipped chocolate peanuts. As I bring to conclusion my poem and rhyme, I would like to say thanks for your indulgence of time. That was awesome. One more time for Deb. Again, if there's any of you online that want to uh, join us, just let uh, George know in the chat. Uh, so next, let's see. Please, sometimes <clears throat> names I don't always get right. So I want to say it's Dewan. Is it Dewan or Dan? D-O-N. A W A N? No? U N A Z A N? Yes. <laughs> Donovan. Donovan. I, yeah. Donovan. <clears throat> Donovan, you want to read? Come on up, please. <laughs> so I always say, forgive me for, because sometimes I read it and I go, That's okay. I might have done this the That's last time, too. That's okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So, uh, hello. <laughs> hey. Howdy, howdy. Uh, um, I've got three for you tonight. Um, just to do a little housewarming. Two of them deal with um, the, the topic and the subject of depression. So, a little trigger warning, but it's only two out of the three. So, um, we're going to start with this one I wrote. It's called Daily Routine. <clears throat> I start off every morning with black coffee and self-loathing. I feel that it makes the grounds taste a little more bitter. After breakfast and a shave and a few razor cuts, I am now ready to face the world. But that's not true. I get a break around noon most days, but first I have to do my little pre-break routine. First thing, I need to get talked down to by my supervisor. Secondly, I have to be ridiculed by him again for another hour. Third, I have to break my back delivering furniture to privileged pansies who think it an insult because I was five minutes behind schedule. Excuse me if there's a little bit of bitterness there. <laughs> Finally, I have to be chewed out by my boss again for that reason. When I'm on my break, I have to resist the temptation to swallow a 40 ounce instead of my usual sourdough sandwich, salad, and a chocolate bar. I have to keep my figure sharp, so what if I'm a little vain in that spot, right? Normally, though, I fail in that struggle and give in to the sweet days of alcoholism. When the day ends at last and my hazing finally ceases, I sit and I vegetate in front of the computer screen. Five hours straight of my two favorite adult cartoons, Archer and the, Avenger, and the Avenger Brothers, a funny combination of alcohol and failure. I can barely watch it though through the tears made by frustration and anxiety, also through not blinking for hours on end. Once that's over and my shirt is soaked in sadness, I crawl into bed to try to forget everything. But like this morning, I know that it's futile, and though I try to shove it down, I, I know that I'll have to repeat it once again tomorrow. The only comfort I have that's real is the 38 special on my nightstand. Cold, black, and so inviting, it beckons me over to speak to it. 
The thought brings me a strange kind of comfort. I, one pull of the trigger and I could end this world tonight, but I don't know why I don't just do it now. Maybe I'm just a masochist. Perhaps I like feeling this pain. Maybe I deserve it. I don't know, but somewhere deep in this scrambled psyche, I just like the emotional stabs or, but I let the tears drown me to sleep and I pass through another dreamless night. I'll do it some other time. This next one's real short, <clears throat> but uh, it's called Rain. The clouds weep softly above me. I stand in their tears, not moving. My thoughts are dead and so is my will to live. And I guess the earth picked up on that because she decided to mourn for me since right now I don't have the energy. I appreciate the effort, but I think I'll go back to bed now. All right, this last one, this one doesn't involve depression, but uh, <laughs> just a little palate cleanser there. Um, but this one I wrote because I've been doing a lot of traveling over the last couple of years and I've been making what I've discovered single service friends people that you're really close with for 24 hours and then you never see again, not because you don't like them, but just things happen. I bet we've all had that happen at one point. So I was thinking about it and I thought I'd write this one for all the people that I was really close with for that span of time because they were all really cool. This one's called Friends. I might not ever see you again, not in this lifetime, maybe not the next. But just know that our meeting was one of the best I ever had. Together we came to this crossroad. I needed support and you needed a light. With our hands clasped together in accord, we trudged through the terrors and misdirections of life. But then we came to a fork in the road and it was then that we had to say farewell. By then though, I could stand confidently and you had found a torch to call your own. Though only for a short time we were companions, friend, in you I have found a good soul. If things were different and time was kind, maybe you and I could have been close as brothers. But we can't fight fate or veer from the path set dead before us, even if our bond was to me as strong as steel. So I hope that you're doing well, brother, in everything that you do. And success and fortune find you too. And whenever I'm curious as to how you are, I'll only need to look to the horizon. There I'll see your beacon, bright and undefeated, signaling that you too are alive and well. Thank you. One more time for Donovan. Thanks, those are great pieces as well. I'm going to ask Lori, if you're online, Lori. Yeah? No? Hello. Hello. Y'all give it up for Lori, please. Woo! Hey, nice shirt. <laughs> All right. So I have, um, do I, is there time for me to read three as long as they're not too long? Of course. Okay. This first one, um, I'll start heavy and then I'll add lighter. I'll end lighter. This one is in response to uh, what's happening in Ukraine. And this is dedicated to the citizens of Ukraine. This is called Hell Can Sometimes Be Frozen. Hell can sometimes be frozen like the staring vacant eyes of an adversary who roams the earth, striking on a winter's night like a sociopath, because this kind of darkness only functions in absence of light, premeditating, plotting, pilfering from his Kremlin lair. Hell can sometimes be frozen, like the nine-year-old huddled next to his terrified yet stoic mother in the dismal train station somewhere in Kyiv. Trembling, wincing with the sounds of explosions, his childhood dying one piece at a time, 
among the pieces of shrapnel fallen to the ground which each military strike. Hell can sometimes be frozen like the souls of an antagonist and his cronies. I shame them to the frozen hell where they emerged. I shame them for the frozen hell they created for the citizens in the countries like the child and his mother, innocence hidden in a train station. And I just realized that shame won't work on those who don't have a conscience. It's a shame their frozen souls will never feel. It's a shame broken souls like broken skin may never heal when exposed to frostbite for too long. Yeah, that was a little intense. I promise it gets lighter. Okay, this one is called Sweat Over Tears. This is based on my new book, Home, that actually we are uh, finishing up the layout tonight. So yes, it's exciting, finally. Every drop of sweat that runs down my forehead after planting the garden or speed walking around the river replaces the tears that once poured out of my eyes and into the wine I used to cherish. I prefer sweat over tears. Thank you. This is the last one. This is an honor of the sacred space that we're performing in and to Dr. Martin Luther King. Dreams matter. I have a dream. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dreams matter, dreams matter, dreams matter. What are your dreams? What are your thoughts? What is your vision? Dreams matter. Who do you admire? Who do you love? Who inspires you? Dreams matter. How will you start your journey? How will you take the next step? How, will, how do you want to make a difference? Dreams matter. Dreams matter. Dreams matter. You matter. Thank you. Love to all. Thank you. And that's actually all I have. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> One more time for Lori, please. Thank you, Lori. Everybody all right? Yeah, all right. Uh, Katie, come on down. Hello, I am Katie Jamison. Um, so this first one, I uh, walk my cat sometimes on a leash. It's pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah, really, he walks me. But that's kind of the foundation of where this is coming from. Uh, at 6 a.m., the buzzing of the towers is as loud as the crickets calling from all sides. Next door, a motorcycle engine revs. I hear just the shell of a child's voice carry over the field. We're quiet in the dark watching for toads in the tall grass by the fence. That's all, this is very simple. Um, and this one I wrote pretty recently. I'll give you a, a weird little background, I guess. Um, a friend and I kind of had a little bit of a falling out um, after I got divorced. She sort of didn't like what happened there. Um, and so we, we kind of like touch base every once in a while, but there's a, like a lot of tension between us. Um, and recently, she texted me uh, a picture of, or like a little video of a tiny little shrimp she put in her fish tank, <laughs> like a little colorful shrimp, um, and, and was just like, how are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, I'm good. That's a, that's a great shrimp. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, but we, you know, it's like there's a lot of tension there, so it's just like a random colorful shrimp. Um, so that's kind of the base of where this is coming from, and she's been posting a lot of shrimp videos <laughs> uh, after a lot of silence like in her own world so there's a lot you know there's a lot of background there but okay my friend your silence breaks in pattern and color wet and glassed in micro lens tiniest shrimp legs 
go into town on hornwort. Brilliant, nearly neon, lobster blue and lobster red. Transparent middle, transparent edges, black heart, must mean something. Is yours beating to connect again? Or simply waterlogged and quite contained in video? When you reach, I always reach back. You are slow, rippling yellow snails safe inside the tank of your choosing. I will not tap on the glass. Um, so this one, uh, I have a sibling named Mercy, um, and, and I was talking to someone about Mercy, and they asked me some questions, and I said, well, Mercy never lived here. They live in the mountains, and that's kind of where this came from, but it sort of went a whole different direction. Mercy never lived here. Mercy lives in the mountains, above the clouds, just beneath the stars and deep in the sea between the waves and rippling sand dunes. They call to you, look up, sun warm, smiling at you. Do not ask or beg, be still. Open up all to the heights, to the raging waters. Shout if it feels right. Cry too, take your shoes right off. Moss soft, earth alive, ankles must dance here. Listen, too, to the sounds your sounds are mixing with. Be so with it, be so very with it, connected living earth toes, air loose, knuckles, that you forget why you saw out mercy in the first place. Your hair down, cheeks wet, it's unfathomable, impossible, unreal, that you had intended to punish yourself with violence and shame. The words and withholding you practice daily since you first heard them from someone called loving, scraping glass shards across your lips. These kinds cannot live here. These are not kinds. These are unkinds. You are finally unloading them by holding so loosely to the hands of the wind. Her promise, strong gusts blow sharp glass ways uh, glass ways up and away into the sea to be wind and water made into rounded hopeful glittering sea glass you can see right through each one tumbling loose through now open hands to sand where someone will see your soft pastel parts sorry your soft pastel parts pick up each one lightly gently and say look how beautiful compelled to slip them all loose into pockets made of the most sturdy material, material known to man. It is love. <laughs> Katie, one more time for Katie. <clears throat> Thank you for being here again and for yeah, accepting my invitation. <laughs> Uh, just wanting you all to know also that we do have a Facebook page. It's called The Poetry Den. Uh, that we also have an Instagram um, account too, which is Poetry Den 2012, I believe. So those are two places that you can always look to see uh, what's going on. Um, also, if there, if you know of some poetry that's happening in the city and would um, like me to share that, I'd like to share that also on our Facebook page to give people the opportunity um, to be a part of uh, this part of the arts. Again, if you want to read and you're out there in the audience or if you're online with us, um, feel free to let me know, let George know, and we will uh, make sure you get on the open mic. So I'm going to ask Valerie. Valerie. Come on up, Valerie. Valerie's new to the poetry den. Show her some love. Hey, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, so my name is Valerie, and I am from South Africa. So a few of my hey. words, thank you, <laughs> uh, might sound a little different to what you're used to, but I hope you still understand. Um, so yeah, I wrote this poem. I hadn't written in a while, um, but recently, last year, I lost my father to COVID, and a week later, my best friend to another illness. 
And so it was quite a devastating time, as you could imagine. Um, but, you know, the light in the darkness is that it allowed me to start writing again. And so this is, yeah, one of the poems that I've dedicated to them. So thank you guys for having me and allowing me the space <laughs> to share. And yeah, I hope you guys can just honor them and grieve with me as I read this poem. Okay. Thank you for your broken love, for not waiting until you'd perfected the art before gifting it to me, for loving urgently, immediately, not threatened by my childish preference for perfection, undeterred by my demands for something better, as if I knew any better. Your unabridged, raw love, mine straight from the ground, impurities and all. Never waiting till the crucible ran clear to crown my head, you were the fire and the gold. Thank you for your borrowed time guarding diamond pebbles in an hourglass that you didn't get to spend, gathered minutes you wouldn't get to keep. Every hour, every moment, every second, every beat, you gladly miscounted and spent a little extra on me, like a poorly planned shopping spree. You really only had just one life. Why spend so much on me? Ran an open tab with the timekeeper, never watched your clock, all my memories are drowned in your tick tock. Till I forgot how to walk, I just danced to your tick tock. Thank you for your reckless hope, not finding your future in the stars, but wishing on them anyway. Filling my head with a fool's dreams, then daring me to dream even larger than fools. Showing me I had no one's shoes to fill and my feet would grow as big as I wanted them that my cup was too deep to be empty and to pour myself out without fear, leading an orchestra, composing an opera of me, not knowing if you'd ever get to hear. Tick-tock was just noise to me then. I never knew. I wish you'd told me what you knew, just how priceless each moment was with you. I would have saved every penny, haggled every vendor, counted every second, paid for every hour, loved you so much quicker, so much bigger, so much louder. How could I have known it would be so quiet? That after tick tock comes silence. So what do I say when I have so much to pour, but your cup is full? I have a million different ways to count one more second with you. So what do I say when I'm living your dreams, but you're asleep? When the tick tock stops, but not my feet, always slightly offbeat. So what do I say when my love outruns the clock? That's simple. I say, thank you. Valerie, very beautiful. Seriously. What an awesome tribute um, that was. Very beautiful. I hope you enjoy being here this evening and I hope you come back. Thank you for reaching out to us. Again, one more time for Valerie. <clears throat> Ted, I think Ted is with us online. Yeah, let's welcome Ted to the open mic session. No sound? Oops. Okay. Ted, we can't hear you. Ted, I think you're still muted. We can't hear you. Let me make sure. Yep. How are we doing now? There we go. Okay. Technology. <laughs> Sorry about that, Dad. You're good. Yes. Uh, are we still muted? No, you're yeah. live. We can hear you All loud right. and clear, Ted. Start All from right. the beginning. All right. Uh, I was listening to wonderful poetry tonight and thinking about why you write. Uh, you write to express yourself, to see how you see the world, how you would like to see the world be. And 
I think all of us have a need to express ourselves in one fashion or another. When I began writing a few years ago, I put down those thoughts myself. And this is what this poem is about. It's called, I am a writer. I'm a writer, a scribe to my thoughts, often surprised with what they brought. Pen in hand, devoted to my written lines, audience to my entries, and a clock's chimes. Some write for a living. For me, it is life-giving, reflecting my moods and ways, tracking my journey for days. I write for myself. Others may also enjoy the words I've chosen to employ. I describe my visions, giving them birth, exposing how life touches me here on earth. Pencil strokes form letters one by one, page by page, slowly reveal my tale until done. I feel my spirits lost when I can't write. I feel the emptiness will be finite. An obsessiveness for which I must provide. Yes, this is my addiction I feed to survive. What do I write when I compose? <laughs> Words transposed into stories, poetry, prose. My reward comes when words rhyme, but not necessary to pass the time or required to keep the beat or to make the script complete. A photographer, I visit the world through a camera's eye. Now, as a writer, I experience life as it slips by. So what will my next, what will my next parchment expose? For that, you'll have to wait and read it, I suppose. Yay. Occasionally, we write just for fun and nonsense. A friend of mine challenged me to write 10 lines, 10 syllables in a line. I asked what would the, the subject be, should have fun with it. So this is just plain silliness. I had fun with it. The title is Anti-Discombobulationism. You figure that one out. Anti-Discombobulationism, Disestablishmentarianism, irrepressibly non-humoristic, pathetically pro-futuristic, philosophically most pathetic, and doodly highly synthetic, rhythmically not unresolvable, metaphorically unsolvable, and conclusively theoretically misinterpreted poetically. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ted. One more time for Ted, please. Um, we still got a few more people. Um, uh, going around for the for the open mic before we bring our featured artists up. And so Wayne, I'd like to invite you to come up to the mic. Please give it up for Wayne, please. Thank you all. I didn't realize how empty I was when I came in. You guys filled me up. Yeah. This is good. This is good. Um, three poems. The thing that they have in common is they all mention my grandmother. They're not necessarily about my grandmother, but she gets mentioned in all three of them. For the first poem, I'll let you know, I am a veteran. I served with the United States Army during a period of war. My America. Walt Whitman, read by Langston Hughes. Senator Eugene McCarthy, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. New Orleans to New England. Mark Twain with Georgia O'Keeffe. The land that I love stands with wounded knee in Pearl Harbor, internment camps for those who do not fit, a world made safe for our democracy when Henry Kissinger sent me to fight his war. So I could later 
send my kids to school, and helping my grandmother pull weeds. All of this, the sad land I love. My grandmother wiped down with her rag the old linoleum yellow green kitchen counter with aluminum border tacked on with brads so a clean flat surface stands ready for her work where she orderly lays out ingredients always the same ones each time same as last year lined up on clean countertop. So now she turns on the oven and then takes down the large white with flower print Fire King mixing bowl that she bought at Sears, molasses. That's the flavor of cookies for today. She knows in advance how they will taste. They will be soft with dark firm edges again. Green greens. A large bag of spinach, an even larger bag of yellow onions, sauteed with curry, moistened with white vinegar, green greens served on a white plate alongside boiled potatoes. He enjoys simple food along with boyhood memories of lunch with his grandmother. Aww. So Wayne, first I want to say thank you for your service. Um, I also thank you again for supporting the portrait and I appreciate that. Because what it does to you, it does for me as well. So um, again, if there's anybody out there that wants to read, please let me know and we will uh, make sure you get heard. Um, nobody yet, right? <laughs> I'm going to rerun before I ask Dan. So, Dan, I hope you're still with us. Um, I'm going to read this last one. This is a favorite of mine. I don't, I'm not sure why I felt urged to read this, but maybe someone needs to hear it. Um, it's a piece I read uh, quite often, especially when I get invited places. I always feel like just because you've read poetry somewhere before doesn't mean that everybody has heard your poetry before. So, um, so I'm always encouraging my poets, like if you read something somewhere else, you do not have to read something new. There's always somebody, probably a majority of people that haven't heard it. Uh, this particular piece is called The Mirror. Uh, it has been published before. <clears throat> and I specifically uh, wrote this piece to myself um, in, in hopes that I would encourage myself. Um, like many of you, uh, I started writing um, out of pain um, because I did not like poetry in high school absolutely did not snoring head down on the on the table um but somehow um journaling didn't do it but poetry did and so i'm very thankful and grateful for the opportunity this piece again is called the mirror <clears throat> sensuous in your behavior yet you waver to love because of fear Fear that the past is too close to the present. And even though that stuff is irrelevant, you can't see the future because you refuse to look in the mirror. A mirror you no longer smile in, for all you see is old wineskin because you've been drinking all the wrong words. Drunk on words that have destroyed your self-confidence. And the evidence is you have not yet claimed your inheritance. There is beauty in your eyes, and the beasts are the lies that try and fertilize seeds of unforgiveness lying on the inside. You see, in order to love another, one must discover your own sleeping beauty, maybe become the author of the book, I Am Pretty. And I like myself. I like myself because of the image of who I was made, a creator who promised never to leave me, but as long as I wanted to stay, and I'll bathe myself in his blood 
that cleanses me from the stench of the day. A day that I will one day understand that church, family, and school weren't the only plan, but have a dominion over my life, hopes, thoughts, actions, and dreams might help my fellow man. So when I look in the mirror, whom shall I fear? False accusations, manipulation, devastation? Or do I start a revolution beginning with internal evolution when I look in the mirror? That's that piece. Dan! I'm ready for you, Dan. Y'all give some, show some love for Dan. Uh, hi, Pam. So the cool thing about doing poetry then from home is you can cook dinner and have poetry. <laughs> um, this is a poem for my wife. <clears throat> Allow me to be your disciple. Let my faith be a fever, a belief, never again to be cooled by the hands of dangerous demons. Let me believe without placing my fingers inside the wounds of misgiving, of pains and injury. I want to wear our love as golden vestment of a priest whose passionate prayer is rejoined and rejoined by joyful thronging voices of thousands raising songs of glory and praise. I want to wear our love like the mantle of a green, expressing fidelity, kissing the hem of our sacred union, past and present tense. I want other lovers to catcall as we saunter in a silky, shining number, turning heads and slick stilettos. I want to wear our love all the days of our lives. And when we get holes from neglect or from trying too hard at life or not hard enough, I want to patch it up with forgiveness. What we have learned will make it whole again, even more, and it's adding. When we are very old and need warmth in our chilled bones, I will cover us with the quilt of memory, the squares of joy shall remind us of laughter and days on beaches and children and so much more and so much more. This one's called How Many Prayers? How many my mother's prayers bought me here today, how generous and heartfelt, the Hail Marys of my father, to hear my father pray as we sat round as a family, the beating wings of angels, lifting, guiding, elevating me to destinations unexpected, undeserved. How many thousands of genuflections did each of them take as they pour their hopes and dreams, your hands clasped in prayer in my life unfold gently, a bud transforming to a flower. Mm, give me a second, Pam, if you would. Ah, here it is. Uh, taking a walk in the woods, which is always fun. I was in the woods yesterday walking with my friend the wind, said wind, listen to me, let me help you clean your mind. When I met Hill, said Hill, let me challenge you and stretch out your body. So my tendons and soul greeted Hill. I was in the wood yesterday with my friend's son. Sun dappled in the greenery, cast shadows to dance and leap and delight. Stream laughed at me and burbled, mocking at my trouble. Stream said, let me carry wrong away. And so she did, across a log and under a bridge, she ran, tossing my, wear, my worries. The tinsel snap of the spider web reminded me of the strength and fragility, how we all are in a moment, whole and possible. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for reading today. It's been wonderful. All right, please give it up for Dan one more time. 
Uh, Dan, like myself, <clears throat> um, has a heart and a passion to to allow people to to shine in their craft and their art. Um, he has a um, he has a thing. Called, it's called Panel Ply, and he showcases artists on there, writers, um, and so that's that's a part of his heart, and he loves to do that. It's, it's a part of my heart. Um, again, if there's anybody that would like to connect with me, I get offers all the time to do poetry. And <clears throat> it would just be nice to uh, bring some of my fellow poets with me so that my face is not, I'm not really interested in that all the time because I always tell people I'm an only child and believe me, entertainment, I, I can entertain myself any day. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, the, the fact that I get to do this every month gives me the opportunity to read, but moreover, I, I mean, I want this space to be an opportunity for, for those that um, have not or always do. And so that's the kind of space that we like to, to create here. And again, if you would like to connect with me and are interested in doing more of this, even around the city, um, please do, because I can definitely um, have you go with, we like to feature people. A lot of times people are, you know, they are giving me money to bring people, so, hey. Yeah. <laughs> money talks, money talks, and lots of other things walk. <laughs> so y'all ready for y'all featured artist? Yes. All right. <clears throat> Ariane gave me this very short, brief bio. <laughs> But I know there's so much more in her, but I'm just gonna read what she what she read, what she gave to me. Ariana's has always been a storyteller. She enjoys the push and pull of poetry and shares her and shares hers in hopes of inspiring others to do the same. Um, that's very it's interesting that you said that because one of my models is the IPMC, and that's to inspire, provoke, motivate, to create, and so. I'm always hoping that if, I, if I've ever done that, that's made my day, my day has been made. So it's nice to hear others that are looking to inspire. So if you all please put your hands together, real good and strong for Ariane. <laughs> I write because words taste sweet. I write because it is such a release to watch as my fingers bleed through the pen splattering on paper words drawing themselves. I write because the words hurt, but inside they taste sweet. I write because inside the words travel. They make their way up the roads and streets, they cross bridges of bone above rivers of blood. They ride the synapses and go underground in the veins and the arteries. They get to my skull and once there, they stay. They dance painfully, heavy feet drumming on soft pulpy ground. They beat me, they batter me, they push bitter tears out of my swollen eyes. The words are no good inside, so I write because outside they taste sweet. Thank you. What's up, y'all? I'm a little nervous. <clears throat> I'll do it. I first came to this show on my birthday in 2017. Um, <clears throat> it was really great. I, uh, I've always loved poetry. Um, I also, yeah, when I was in high school, like you were saying, I, I was like, what's Shakespeare even saying, honestly, this whole time, and iambic pentameter, like all of that seemed, there seems to be so many rules that I couldn't really just be part of it, you know? So yeah, I started writing at some point out of pain, and you know, here we are. Yeah, I don't want, it's fine. We can deal with it, we can deal with it. Um, so, I wanted to tell you guys a story, like I said, you know, and uh, 
<clears throat> we talk about my crazy life, but I do believe that I've been blessed a lot. I have, a, I've lived a very, very blessed life. We've, my whole family has. Um, and speaking of family, they're all here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my mom's here. It's my first time my mom see me on stage do poetry. Yeah. She was like, stop making noise uh, while they're talking. And I'm like, mom, we're supposed to make noise for the poets, mom. Can you guys tell her that? Is that right? We're supposed to make noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My siblings are really supportive. My sister, my two brothers, I have a couple friends, a few friends that came too. Thank you guys so much and everyone who's here. And I just want to say, Valerie, what you did up here was insane. Thank you so much. That was, that. Ma, it's my stage. It's my stage, Mom. <laughs> Alice Chusa, please. It's my stage. Thank you. Um, but thank you guys so much. Thank you. So I love my family. I love my family. I'm sure we all have so much love for our families. But family sometimes really complicated and really rough. And it's hard to put your heart and your mind together to always just have, you know, just no pain, just love. And so sometimes the words help me do that. So, this poem is called Snapshots. <clears throat> I sit in the brown lit room with a large photo album. It is heavy, full of generations. It is mine to hold and to give when my hands grow too gray to turn its thick gilded pages. I move through it slowly, savoring smiles. Here, a marble top table full of plates and shells and lo mein and rib tips, fried rice and sugar frosted balls of dough. We always preferred buffets where we could stay busy, filling ourselves. The entire meal, a choreographed dance of up and down and ew, why'd you get that? And <laughs> what does your fortune say? Restaurant trips, a sure fire, fire way to let us know there was still leftover love to be found in our parents' wallets. Next, a deck of cards spread out in fans on the low mahogany table. Butts sk squished together on the couch, wrists twisted hiding my hand. Dad's bloodshed eyes across from me. At first terrifyingly stern, then crinkling in as he lays his entire palm down to win the game. I am relieved, just too accustomed to the unpredictable swing of things. A minute later, the baby will howl with loss and the game might be over, television clinking on snappishly as we all go our separate ways, or dad may laugh and teach him about patience. We walk into church, dressed in different shades of somber expressions. The pews are cold wood. We will sit, stand, kneel, stand, sit, kneel, sit, sit, stand, hold hands and chant, breathe in incense and intonations, whine and proclamations, fight in the parking lot and ride home in a suddenly stifling space. We rush out of the movie after only a few minutes. The waste of money angers my father beyond belief. I try to tell him Eight Mile wasn't a family movie, but he knew better <laughs> until he did it. Some years later, we watch a movie about a Greek wedding. There's something in it for all of us. Mom loves the wifely wisdom shared, that while the head may decide the course of the body, the neck supports and allows him to turn. Dad sees himself in all the education the old man gives freely, amid sprays of Windex and cries about when his daughter will find a husband. We all laugh heartily at the antics, a runaway grandmother in black and overcrowding of cousins, the cake with an unexplain unexplainable hole in it. I will always appreciate its message, its insistence that changing the course of your life starts internally. But the best thing about the Greek wedding is how it unites the innocence in all of us and reminds us of the sweetness of our fruit. Let's talk about some pain. Y'all ready? So <laughs> you, you don't you 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 don't want me to? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so willingly and unwillingly, I set out at a young age. It's been it's been a rough rough time, but like I said, you know, it's given me art and it's made me who I am. So 
here's a poem about a time that, you know, times that I stumbled. Can you get it? Can I have, is there something, can I put a chair here to? No, to, no, no, no. <clears throat> this poem is called Drunk. At first, there's the uncertainty. Will this really work again? This mug I lift to my lips, full of six parts Bacardi rum and half a part fruit juice. Or is it Captain Morgan spice rum and French hazelnut coffee cream? Or maybe it is simply the cold, cold bottle of pineapple vodka, sweet and sweet and burning and delicious. My tongue makes love to the rim, pushing in between the grooves, finding every last drop clinging to the cheap glass. Oh, yes. It does work. I throw my head back and smile at nothing. I try to dance. The inside of my loop, my lips, the roof of my mouth, the scent of the skin lining my nostrils, the back of my teeth. So much good. I taste it everywhere. Happiness tastes a lot like the entire contents of two bottles of Arbor Mist Sangria. Peace of mind can be found at the bottom of every $5 pitcher of Blue Paths draft beer. After I finish mine, I'll check yours for you. <laughs> Let's pregame on the way to the pregame party before going to the bar to get drunk. Please, if I don't get drunk, it'll be like I'm not even in the same room as you. It'll be like you're inside, warm and cozy by a fire on a rough winter night, while I'm outside looking in. Frostbitten hands stuck to the window, nose squashed against the glass as I desperately seek to come in. There's just no fucking point if I don't get drunk. So <clears throat> made it through that, you know, survive, learn some things. If you are curious about what got me from there to here, you know, come talk to me. It's been a lot. It's been a it's been a, it's been a good amount of work. So during this time that I was surviving and growing and learning myself, I wanted to find myself in people, you know, in friends, relationships, everything. So definitely I've written a lot, a lot of love poems. We don't have time for all of them today, but I do have one for you guys, one of my very favorite ones. It's called Crumbs. <clears throat> I keep reaching for the crumbs, bright yellow against a darkly cracked pavement. I see them and I die for them. I want to drown in his sweet smiles, to lean in and rub myself into his smell so he can mark me, to live forever in the spaces of his breath between one laugh and the next. The crumbs melt like sweet butter on my tongue and I'm empty until I see the next one winking at me. I keep bending down and picking them up, some so small all I can do is lick my finger and press down on them, hoping they stick with me all the way back up to my mouth where they will linger the sound of his voice saying my name. I keep hoping that following the sweet trail of yellow cake crumbs will lead me to the ultimate love. That after a while, I won't have to bend my back, pop my knees. I won't have to chew and spit out the grit and sand. I keep hoping that at some point I'll be presented with a lovely big piece of cake on a pretty plate. The fork in my hand will be light, but capable. Her tine softly sinking into that slice of goodness. The hand holding the plate will be steady and I will surely savor that first bite with my whole being. That first complete morsel that fills my entire mouth instead of a swiftly, swiftly melting spot of sweetness in the middle of my tongue. And every bite after that will only get better. The cake sweeter, the cream thicker, the luscious aftertaste lasting longer. But not all crumbs are a trail. Some may just have been blown off course. Maybe they all have been blown off course. Maybe I'm not supposed to be picking up the crumbs at all. Maybe the cake will just come to me whole as it is, no pieces falling off. Someone so full of vibrant love, it just can't be contained. Maybe I don't have to work at receiving the sweetness. I just need to stand still and grow, cultivate my own flowering and let the gift be presented to me.
Doesn't that sound good? Like I want some, you know? Mm -hmm. Give me some good cake. <laughs> or I got the cake, you know what I mean? Now I'm playing. Sorry, mom. Um, okay, so I would say poetry and a lot of surprisingly introspective times really, you know, got me to where I'm confident, you know, and I'm speaking in front of people and sharing deeply emotional things. You know, I, uh, my family's from Rwanda. Um, that's why I was like, hey, um, we're from Rwanda and uh, we came here in 2002. Well, I came here in 2002 and uh, learned English that year, stuttered a lot, learned what bullying was. I didn't know that what it was before that, you know, in school and just really struggled to not feel bad about who I am in any situation. So I really strongly believe in the power of poetry here. And uh, when I lived in Indianapolis a couple years ago, I had a bit of a business where I led workshops and, you know, all age groups, like little kids, older people, everyone, um, had a really good time helping people immortalize their own truth and their deep feelings about themselves. Because when you put it in art, nothing can take that away. You know, you get busy with regular life, you know, someone cut you off in traffic, now you're mad for a couple hours. You haven't seen a dentist in six years, like you're thinking about that randomly, you know, there's, you, you get lost in the daily, you know, the day things. And so <clears throat> putting how you feel about yourself in a poem gives you something to reach for. So here's one that I really love and I'm definitely reaching for. It's called Fire. <clears throat> Have you ever noticed how fire is always dancing? Never still. All fire wants is to be and to become as large as possible, as wide, as charging. Fire just wants to dance free. Fire does not concern herself with you. You can melt on her tongues for all she cares. You could dive deeply and either burn bright bones flashing or swim in her never ending, perpetually upward sweeping, merciless in her grace. Fire just wants to dance. Be like fire, need to be like fire, need to be like fire. All fire wants to do is to dance, to fill. Sometimes it is so good to just be like fire. You would think that there might be days when fire wants to be left alone, just like any other sensible being. That if only the currents in the air would slow down or just stop. Oh, sorry. That if only the currents in the air would just slow down or just stop sometimes, then fire could finally be still, glow, grow, soft at the edges with her arms open wide, cream yellow rising. And yet, isn't it poetic and just absolutely satirical that if you cut it off, if you put a physical barrier between fire and that which makes her dance, jitter constantly blows her back and forth, at times nearly extinguishing her last blue breath, if you dare to cover the fire, rather than staying still, looking at you, grateful for the silence, fire will just die. Just die. Fire craves movement. Fire craves motion. Fire just wants to dance a world of creation, a phoenix calling herself into being, whipping long lashes of hot gold, stirring it up into storms, windswept chunks smoking, all landing back into the pool of herself from which she will rise and so start the cycle all over again. And you will consider yourself highly coveted, favored and blessed beyond measure to have been a witness to the vision. I have to apologize. I've been stumbling a little bit through my words. And uh, when I was living in Indianapolis, I felt really lucky. You know, I got to <clears throat> attend all kinds of different shows. There were shows where you could tell the poets were professional. You know, they're talking about their breath count <laughs> in each thing, you know, they're doing their, their, you're really like having to, you feeling like you really need to make sure you do your best with them. There were smaller shows that came around that, 
you could tell that maybe somebody just really needed to have somebody listen to what they wanted to say that day. I like those shows too. Thank you guys for coming. <clears throat> but what I really, 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 really felt challenged by and appreciated the challenge of was having to memorize a poem, having to really live and breathe what I'm saying and keep it going with my mind and my emotions and keep it going in front of people. So I, uh, I really appreciate poets who do that. And I love the poem you did, the one, the, the last one you did about that. So this last poem that I have for you guys, it's called Sunrise. So uh, I attended Job Corps. Anybody know what Job Corps is? Mm -hmm. Job Corps, yeah. So it's a trade school to help um, underprivileged people, youth, 16 to 24, just a quick shout out. If you need your GED, need a trade, do it. You know, I have, uh, I got my nursing degree through Job Corps for free 99. So I think every, everyone should, should let people know about that. So um, when I was at Job Corps though, I struggled a lot just emotionally keeping up with all the work. And so what was really great was when a few times when I'd wake up really early on the weekend and I would go out and see the sunrise. And uh, the first couple of times it happened, it was really funny. You know, I had to have one RA set it up and call security and let him know it's gonna be a student walking around at 5 a.m. Don't, you know, whatever. So uh, it was always, uh, Job Corps was interesting. So this poem is called Sunrise. My surprise, having become vocal, rushed out of my mouth on a warm wind, barely wrapped around my breath when I saw the sunrise. My hand slowly traveled up without permission, rested on my cheek as if to stop the sounds still running out, or perhaps just to hold my face up against the wonder playing out in front of me. The sky was so vibrant and joyous. Streaks of color in the sky reflected off dimples on the surface of the lake, peeked through the tops of furry trees. There were blues and pinks and purples and gold highlights. There were colors too alive to describe the demand to be witnessed so they can fully introduce themselves. Even the ghostly gray essences of scattered clouds were grand, majestic. I stood mesmerized. And even though I stood absolutely still, I began to become breathless and agitated from holding in the weight of this beauty. I felt as though a private performance had been put on just for me. There was a quickening in my chest. I felt the beginnings of power, a glimpse of what could be. I wanted to open up my throat and sing and see if my voice was sufficient enough to pull the sun up faster. I wanted to throw my hands up and laugh and breathe because I knew it would be enough to power me up into flight. Staring across the hills and into the eye of the sun felt like a gift, a promise, a proclamation shouting that I could do anything and I can. I can do anything that I want to do. Thank you guys. Thank you. So I just want to say if you want to connect with me and talk about anything, you know, talk about performing. I also do on the spot commission poetry with a vintage typewriter. So it's always a really fun time for everybody. Um, and like I said, I do these workshops, did them as parties. You can follow me on social media. If you have Instagram or Facebook, I'll spell my name because <laughs> it's going to be. Uh, so my first name is A-R-I-A-N-E. And my last name is C-Y-U-S-A on all social media all across. Thank you guys. Just one more time for Ariane, please. <clears throat> I'm really grateful for uh, her gift of poetry and that um, she reached out to me and has always been um, very like excited about coming alongside and doing uh, some poetry with me. And so I appreciate her um, accepting um, the invitation to be our featured artist. Please connect with her, those of you that uh, do write uh, or enjoy poetry. It's always good to hear feedback. Um, this kind of 
unfortunately concludes the poetry day for tonight. Um, usually our span is from six to eight. When COVID came along, it kind of threw everything in disarray, as we know with a lot of things. Um, but the more people that we get to sign up and do poetry, uh, the longer that you know we can expand our time to that that eight o'clock realm. But what I don't like to do is to drag people out. You know, um, like the people that are here, we want you to be heard. We want people to share. We want our featured artists to be acknowledged and supported. And then, yeah. Um, but this gives us um, some time to connect with people. But again, we have a Facebook page. Make sure you like our page. You can always find out when the next event is. You can see other events when people give them to me. Uh, we again have uh, Instagram, uh, Poetry Den 2012. Um, so connect with me there. You can always, if you message me, um, usually I re will reply. Usually I will reply within 24 hours, 48 hours. <laughs> I really try to be good at that, but sometimes a lot of times, a lot of voices are talking at the same time. Uh, but usually I'm pretty good at that. Um, but yeah, so I appreciate you all coming tonight. Thank you for all of those that have shared, those of you online that was with us, either if you joined us with poetry or just are there to support. Um, again, my name is Pam Blair and Thank you for being at the Portrait Day. We'll be back here next month with another featured artist. So we welcome you to come back. I think Dan's gonna be our um, featured poet for March, if I'm not mistaken. But again, thank you so much. You all have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.